The 120 Days of Sodom American Psycho Blood Meridian A Clockwork Orange Cows The Girl Next Door Johnny Got His Gun Last Exit to Brooklyn Lolita The Wasp Factory This is just a brief sampling of the literary titles that historically are most often dubbed disturbing. Disturbing literature. It is not necessarily a genre, although it is a descriptor most often associated with horror. However, titles of all classifications have come to be called disturbing, and I would even argue that so-called literary fiction most often comes to be described as such. Although they sometimes certainly aid in creating a disturbing effect, the disturbing is not entrenched in genre tropes. It is more of a feel, an emotion elicited, a reader's reaction, an unforgettable wound to the human psyche that is highly subjective. It is common for this descriptor to be used, sometimes even synonymously, with extreme or splatterpunk titles, titles of a grisly and violent nature. Yet, disturbing literature can cover a wide range of topics depending on what precise buttons it is pushing in the reader's mind. A graphic mutilation scene can sometimes not even hold a candle to the quieter, more subtle dread that escalates throughout the interiorities that certain authors expertly drive us through, leaving us in awe of the dexterity with which they can navigate the ugliness and perversity of the human condition. Today we are delving once more into this world of disturbing, perturbing, unsettling and unsavory literature. We are visiting the forbidden nature of transgressive thoughts, the depraved grazing and beholding of taboos, the monstrous hunger for destruction, the evil power that the written word holds. Today we are truly talking about the most disturbing books. Oh, Jesus Christ, you scared the shit out of me. Well, hello there, and welcome to a super duper special installment of the most disturbing book series here at Plagued by Visions. I am your host, Juan. And as always, you caught me right in the middle of reading a book that is absolutely going to demolish my already fragile psyche and send me diving headfirst into existential oblivion. But no worries. I can get back to that later. Yes, we have reached the seventh installment of this extensive, and I mean extensive series. We've seemingly covered it all, haven't we? So far in the previous six installments, we have named 114 titles of the most depraved, most impactful, most relentless, and most unsettling literature imaginable. We have covered the most extreme corners of horror, the literary titles that conceal sinister undercurrents, We've named non-fiction detailing the most unbearable atrocities in history, and we've even thrown some children's books here and there. There couldn't possibly be more titles to go through, right? We've covered it all, right? I'm probably scraping the bottom of the barrel at this point, right? <laughs> no, far from it, actually. There's still plenty, plenty of disturbing shit to go around. However, I will say, this time around, I have enlisted some help. Well, lots of help, actually. Like, 
a tremendous, almost overwhelming amount of help. For this seventh installment of my Boast Disturbing Book series, I have invited some of my and your favorite booktubers to talk about, recommend, warn against, and or even vomit over the most disturbing books that they have read. Well, I just said I invited some of them, didn't I? The truth is, I actually invited a lot of them. Like, a shitload of them. <laughs> I think that's the precise unit of measurement. You know, I was thinking I would err in the side of caution and invite plenty of them, expecting most of them to say no, and then something like, have you considered therapy? You know, given the subject matter at hand. However, I was so proud and overjoyed by the fact that all of these amazingly talented, intelligent, and insightful creators were more than willing to delve into all that ugliness and monstrosity. In fact, most of them were gleeful and excited by the prospect. It's nice to know you're not the only weirdo out there, isn't it? So yes, today I am handing this stage over to these incredible individuals and they will be the ones presenting the disturbing compendium at hand. All I can say is they picked some good ones. Some of them even made me sick to my stomach just hearing about them. No joke. So I hope you enjoy and I hope you find this cast's disturbing picks to your liking or disliking or whatever you hope to get out of this. The one thing I ask is that you please, please, go show some support to all of these amazing people over at their channels. All of their links will be down in the description, of course. So please, show them some love, especially since they've worked so hard compiling a list of books that are sure to just eviscerate your vibe. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to get back to my reading before I go lie down and stare at the ceiling for the entirety of my sleepless night. So, have fun. Hello, fellow little plaguers in the Vision Hive. I'm Olivia of AV Reads. This is Roland. And Juan has so nicely asked me to come on here and talk about a disturbing book that I've read. And I read a lot of horror, so you would think that my disturbing pick would be a, a horror read. Um, but for me, disturbing doesn't really, it's not the most gruesome things that you read for me. It's not the most like spooky and eerie, although those things can be disturbing. But disturbing for me is more about whenever a book holds up a mirror to yourself and you have to look at yourself in ways that you don't like, um, look at society in ways that are upsetting, um, maybe break inalienable rules that we think are, you know, the sacred things in life. Like that's, that's what's disturbing to me. And so not a horror read that I've picked today, but a literary fiction from 2018, Ghost Wall by Sarah Moss. Ghost Wall by Sarah Moss is about Sylvie, a 17 year old girl who goes on vacation with her family led by the patriarch of the family, Bill, who is obsessed with Iron Age Britain and the reenactment of that and getting down to your British roots in the most true sense. Um, and they're joined on this trip by a local university professor as well as like some, some grad students, some university students, and they're like live action role playing, being Iron Age British people. And for me, what makes this book so disturbing? First of all, it's already set on like these spooky English moors. And on top of that, it, it looks at, you know, the dangers of nostalgic nationalism. It looks at what that means whenever our family gets poisoned by those things. This is a book that's clearly written in response to Brexit, but for me, makes me think of like a lot of the stuff that we've really been dealing with in the United States for the past, I mean, always, but like in the past few years with like QAnon and, you know, conspiracy theories on Facebook, that we think of family as like this unbreakable bond, but maybe it's, maybe it's not. <laughs> and like, that's disturbing too, to think about like, okay, what are, if I can't depend on 
my flesh and blood, what can I depend on? What is real? Clearly like this Britishness is um, this authentic return to your roots thing is a mythology, but then what can we depend on? So the book gets very dark. The, the ghost wall in question, it's a Iron Age structure in Britain that is built out of stones and skulls and bones and requires a live sacrifice in order to provide protection to your land. So there's definitely actual like spooky elements at play too, but for me, the disturbing things are nationalism and what does like family really mean? So I hope you enjoy. Hi everybody, my name is Black Acre Doe. You might recognize me from my extremely professional guitar content. It's kind of, it's honestly harder to explain than it is to play. I'll just play it slow. Or more recently, my wildly thought out and eloquent horror book reviews. Submitting himself I think I got dumped because I smell too good. But today I'm here to share with you the most disturbing book I've ever read. And I'd like to preface this by thanking Juan for including me among this lovely cast of other horror booktubers, some of my favorites, some people I call friends, and some I shall be checking out for the first time. Now, before I go into my pick, I want to make clear that I do not recommend this book per se. It is just the most disturbing thing I've ever read. And that would be Notice by Heather Lewis. Now, I'll read a little bit from the back. It says, Heather Lewis has written this novel with a power and pain almost unbearable like some freak-ass despondent Jesus nailing herself to the cross again and again. We are dragged into a suffering transcendent only because it has been told. So basically this novel follows a young woman who was born into a wealthy family, but her parents seem very distant and kind of not even in the picture in this book. And she turns to becoming a sex worker and she frequents a local um, parking lot at a local bar and catching men coming home from work and um, has sex for money and to her it's just this kind of loveless transaction and to her that's what sex always has been. And she comes across this man who offers to pay her to basically be the object of extreme sexual torture and fantasy between um, this man and his wife, basically just their, you know, sexual object, and they call her Nina because that was their daughter's name, and it's pretty unclear, but it very much seems like the father murdered his daughter. To me, the, the main reason why this is so bleak, there's a couple reasons, but for me the first thing I thought of was that anytime the main character, she is supposed to have been protected, um, people fail her miserably and it, the worst case scenario happens. Just bleak and brutal, there's no real moral to the story or happy ending or anything. It just reads like a suicide note. Just everything that can go wrong does go wrong and you're just watching this young woman's life get ripped apart. And um, you know, to add to the bleakness of everything, this was published two years after the author Heather Lewis committed suicide. So this was my pick for the most disturbing book I've ever read, noticed by Heather Lewis. Thank you again to Juan for having me. Love you, buddy. You're the true king and queen of darkness, and we all love you. Thank you. Everyone stay safe. Have a good holiday. Peace. Hey, everyone. It's Dave and Olive from Book Blather. We want to thank Juan for inviting us to this collab. We love the Disturbing Book series and we're excited to actually be a part of it. So the disturbing book that we're talking about today is Nod by Adrian Barnes. This was originally published in the UK in 2012. It, it didn't win, but it was shortlisted for the Arthur C. Clarke Award. Uh, Barnes had described this as the first in a trilogy uh, but unfortunately he passed away before he wrote any subsequent books. You wouldn't know that this was supposed to be part of a series because it, it's a totally completely self-contained story. So what this book is about is it's a unique post-apocalyptic tale based on the premise that the entire world is suddenly unable 
to fall asleep. So it's set in Vancouver and it's told in the voice of our main character, Paul. And he is, he's a bit of a, a, a recluse. He's kind of antisocial and, and he writes books on etymology, lost words, which is kind of a bonus um, for the reader. And Paul is the rare one in 10,000 people that is actually able to sleep. Um, they call them the sleepers. And he has a partner, Tanya, who is like everybody else. You know, if you, if, if you can't sleep, within a week, you've gone crazy. And in a month, you're probably dead. So when the whole world is unable to sleep, um, the world pretty quickly unravels and devolves into chaos. This sort of walks you through that and, and shows you what happens. And the, bo the, the book starts in, you know, around like uh, day 18, I think. You know, when, where you're in the full throes of insanity to give you a little glimpse of what happens. Um, but then it, it, it goes back to the beginning and kind of walks you through day by day what happens as society starts to unravel. It kind of plays on our um, helplessness regarding sleep. You know, we've all had those nights where, you know, we, we, we can't fall asleep and we really need to. And, and, and you know, and, and eventually, you know, that magical moment happens and we have no control over it. We're not aware of it when it happens. But, of course, except in those rare cases of insomnia, you know, it always works out. But what if it didn't? A lot of it we see through Paul witnessing what happens to his partner, Tanya, and how she interacts um, with all the other Awakeners. And, you know, to, to observe just the deterioration of literally everything. Of relationships, of individual people, of society at large. And it's really disturbing to see um, when n nobody is able to sleep and everybody goes mad what types of things people can and will do and how society will restructure itself and who will, will come to lead the new, um, the new world. This was a really good book. Um, it was a really disturbing book and we highly recommend it. That's the review of Nod by Adrian Barnes and uh, Olive and I will see you next time. Hello, it's Alex, the Bookubus. Thank you to Juan for inviting me to be a part of this video. I'm kind of cheating here and I'm going to talk about two books. They're by the same author and they have some similar themes, so I figured I could get away with it. And they are The Cormorant and The Wood Witch by Stephen Gregory. He is a British author, or should I say British author, and these are two of his novels that came out in the 1980s. So The Cormorant is about a couple and their young son who inherit a cottage in Wales because of the death of the main character's uncle. But there's a catch. If they want the house, they also have to agree to take care of the uncle's pet cormorant, which is a very large water bird and not your typical pet. They decide that they can't pass up the opportunity to start a new life in the countryside, so they give it a go. And the main character, he becomes obsessed with the bird and it starts to change him and his behaviour and some very unsettling things play out. And the Wood Witch follows a male character who is humiliated in the bedroom by his girlfriend and he doesn't take it too well and he gets violent with her and because they work together he is placed on a sabbatical and he ends up going to this remote cottage in Wales <laughs> see a theme here so it's just him and his dog in this remote cottage they're just hanging out and going for long walks through the local woodland and one day he stumbles upon a wood witch which is a name for a rather phallic shaped fungus and he decides he wants to grow one for his ex-girlfriend as you do and this becomes an obsession of his again see the theme there so the process he goes through is 
pretty messed up and disgusting and makes for some uncomfortable reading. So like I said there are some similarities between these two books but the stories themselves are very different and the stories build slowly to some very intense and brutal endings. If you are looking for some disturbing reads of the quieter, slow burn, literary variety then I highly recommend The Cormorant and The Wood Witch by Stephen Gregory. What's up everybody, my name is Brad and I'm from the channel Brad Proctor and I wanted to give a huge thanks to Juan for inviting me onto his channel to be part of his most disturbing books series. So thanks Juan for inviting me on, I do very much appreciate it. Today I want to talk about a book called Tender is the Flesh, and I'm probably going to butcher the author's name, no pun intended, by Augustina Basterica. Now for me I want to say that I don't necessarily get disturbed while reading books, I'm kind of weird, I know it's all fiction in my head so it doesn't really bother me. But the reason I chose this book to talk about as part of this series is because of the plausibility that everything in this book that happens could in fact happen in our reality and it wouldn't be something far-fetched, it wouldn't be something completely out of left field. It feels like this actually could plausibly happen in our world and if that were the case that would truly be a disturbing thing. So this book, Tender is the Flesh, this is a cannibalism story but it is not a bunch of tourists in the jungle that get lost and eaten by some savages for dinner. It's much grander, it's much broader than that. This is cannibalism on a grand global scale. This is industrialized cannibalism. It's highly regulated with laws, rules, regulations. It's government approved, all that kind of stuff. It is cannibalism that has become the norm in society in this dystopian book. All the animals on earth have become infected with some disease. It doesn't really bother the animals or affect the animals, but it does affect humans. It is very deadly to humans. So if you eat meat that was infected by this disease, or if you have a pet that's infected by this disease, it can kill you. So what has happened? We as humans, we have tried to eradicate all animal life on Earth as best as we can. So there's no more livestock anymore, no cows, pigs, chickens, any of that kind of stuff. People don't have household pets anymore, no dogs, cats. So that is the dystopian society setting that we're living in. So if there's no meat to eat, what have we, we resorted to? Well, there's one meat source left on Earth that is not inherently deadly, and that is humans. Like I said, this is highly industrialized, regulated cannibalism. So we are breeding humans to be raised and slaughtered for the sole purpose of feeding us as a source of meat and protein. And that was my favorite part of the book. The part I found most captivating, most fascinating, was the level of depth and detail that the author goes into creating this world, thinking of every single possibility, what would really need to happen and go on for this to be a sustainable thing in society. And it's the moral dilemma of our main character that brings up this social commentary on humans and human rights specifically and what constitutes one person or one certain group of people to have certain rights and freedoms as opposed to another group of people. That was something that was very thought-provoking, very provocative, on top of an already very chilling, grotesque storyline where it's normal now to eat humans for dinner. And that's why I picked this to be a disturbing book because of the plausibility of it. You know, in this book, there was a virus that changed society as they knew it. They had to change and adapt to the new normal. And that is something that we're sort of going through now. Different circumstances, but sort of the same thing as well. Um, I've had some friends that have read this and they said they're going to turn vegetarian for a few days just because of how disturbing and vile and grotesque this book is at times. Uh, this is Tender as the Flesh, and again, my name is Brad. Thank you so much, Juan, for inviting me onto the channel once again. Thank you for spending your time with me, and I'll talk to y'all later. Bye. Hi, I'm Ollie, and I wanted to start by saying a huge thanks to Juan for asking me to be part of his legendary Most Disturbing Book series. Um, the book I want to talk to you about is Nocturne by Ed McBain, which is part of his long-running 87th Precinct series of police procedural novels. Um, so there's over 50 books in the series. You can read them individually, you don't have to read them in order. Um, this is one of the later ones, comes from 1997. The series started in the 50s, so this is you know very much towards the tail end of the series. Why have I chosen this as a most disturbing book? Um, 
there's a crime in here so obviously these are crime novels they've all got crimes in them but there's a crime in here which is far and away the most disturbing thing that's in any of the books and the fact that it comes in such a long series of books I think really adds to its impact um, so you know these are books with uh, characters you know particularly detectives and their families and things like that that continue through all of the books so they because you know the characters there's a kind of an almost a coziness to the books um, you know you feel like you are sinking back into you know a comfortable armchair when you read one of these books so the fact that this one has such a horrible crime in it um, is I think makes it doubly shocking so the crime is the um, torture and murder of a prostitute by these three um, rich college guys and and the the detail of the crime is just horrific it's far more graphic than anything that's in any of his other books so as a reader you see the actual you see the start of their attack on her so they they hire her as a prostitute start having sex with her and then their actions gradually get more and more violent and she gets more and more distressed as it as it carries on and then it just kind of ends and you know in the next scene she's dead what then happens as the investigation proceeds through the book and the forensics happen and things like that is you learn more and more detail of the horrible horrible things that have been done to her um, and it, it just builds and builds and builds and gets more and more disturbing over time. Um, McBain is an incredibly talented writer and seeing him, you know, deliver something as gruelling as what's in here, which, you know, really does at times feel like it, it feels like something from a Bret Easton Ellis novel to me. This feels like, you know, particularly with the, the fact that the um, attackers are college boys, it, it feels like the missing link between um Lesson Zero and American Psycho and, and you know the other element to it is the fact that if you know they just have absolutely no concept that what they've done is wrong um, they feel completely empowered to do the things that they've done and they think that they're going to get away with it and you know for a long part of the book the investigation is just drawing blanks and it really does feel like this is going to be a crime that, that will not be solved and that the victim will not get justice um, which makes it even worse. Um, so anyway, that's my pick for most disturbing book. Um, if you've never read McBain, you should do. He's fantastic. Thank you very much. My name is Nikki, also known as Dark Between Pages in this crazy book world. And before I jump in and share the book that I have picked for this fantastic collab, I want to send a huge thank you to Juan for inviting me to be a part of this collab. I am absolutely honored and I cannot wait to see how this all ends and the finished project once it is up. And I'm honored to be alongside such a fantastic group of people. Today we were supposed to pick out a book that is most disturbing or that it's disturbed us in some way. I went a little different for this pick. So many of you guys in the book community know that I am a huge indie and small press fan, supporter. I read a lot of it, but I did not pick an indie author or small press published book today, nor did I pick a horror book or even a dark fiction book. Today I went with a non-fiction. It is called Unthinkable, An Extraordinary Journey Through the World's Strangest Brains by Helen Thompson. This story to me is disturbing, not in the sense of like a mind bending, chilling, can't sleep at night type story. This story to me is I have I want to call it an obsession, but that may be the wrong word to use. I have this intrigue with the human mind, our brains. It is an incredibly powerful tool. But it can act up or it can attack us at any point and it can decide how things are going to change or what it's going to do to us in so many different ways. And I love the story, being a nonfiction and learning about the world's most unique minds that are out there, I found incredibly powerful and intriguing and interesting, but at the same time it disturbed me in the sense that our brain can decide that it's going to do this complete flip at any time in our life some people are born with something like this and others it just happens 
you know, mid-afternoon on a Tuesday. And I think alongside realistic horror or true crime reads where people's lives can be changed with the snap of a finger, going about their day-to-day -day routine, not knowing that they're about to be attacked, I think of this in the same type of sense. The people and the minds that are in the story are incredible, absolutely incredible, from a man who believes he's a tiger to a man that believes he's dead, to a woman who's constantly turned around and never knows where she's at or, or which direction she's heading. I think the mind is incredibly powerful. It intrigues me, it inspires me, but at the same time, it absolutely terrifies me and disturbs me to know that this greatest power, this tool that we have, this magnificent piece of us can change our lives at any given point. Again, I wanna thank Juan so much for having me on, and it was fun to pick something a little bit different than what I normally pick to talk about, but this is probably one of my all-time favorite nonfiction books that are out there, and I would definitely recommend it for anybody that's interested in the human mind, in the human brain. Thank you, and I will see you guys later. Hey friends, Elizabeth Sagewood here with a book recommendation for you. But first, I wanna extend a huge thanks to Juan for asking me to be part of this amazing collaboration. Thank you so much, and I hope everybody that's watching gets a good list of books to add to their TBRs. So for me, myself, if you've ever watched my channel, you know that I am not really into extreme horror or anything that has a whole lot of body gore. But to me, what really is the most terrifying is anything that's true crime. Because to me, it's the real life horrors that keep me up at night. So one book that I wanted to recommend to you is Tears of Rage by John Walsh. And of course, John Walsh is the founder of America's Most Wanted, amongst other shows. And he's been a real advocate for missing children and murdered children since his own son, Adam, went missing and was ultimately murdered back in 1981. And we all probably know of this case or know the case pretty well, but the way the story is told from John's point of view, and it really delves deeply into all of the layers that happened with this situation and how he came out the other end and started his activism. So this book came out back in 1997 and I was about 14 at the time, 14 or 15, and this book really tore me apart. I, at several occasions, had to put this book down and leave it for a day or so before I could pick it up again because this is an absolutely heart-wrenching story. So of course we're dealing with what happened to Adam, but we're also really seeing the unraveling of a family, a mother who is racked with guilt because she left him just for a few moments and he got taken. And this happened during a time way back in 1981 when stuff like this just didn't happen. So it really, tore the country apart, it tore this family apart, and this book goes into somewhat graphic detail about what happened to Adam, but also John Walsh had received a very graphic letter from someone who confessed to the crime who was sitting in jail, and all of these points together just make this book absolutely heart-wrenching. And like I said, it's the true crime, it's the true stories that keep me up at night. This is truly horror to me, so I highly recommend picking up Tears of Rage by John Walsh. It's definitely going to get you in the feels and if you're into true crime at all, you're definitely going to enjoy this one. So there you go. That is my recommendation for the book that most disturbed me. I hope everyone has a safe and wonderful holiday season and of course, as always, stay spooky everybody. Bye. Hey everyone, my name is Erin and my channel name is Erin Megan. I talk about horror books, manga, spooky stuff, and sometimes do things with horror movies involved. And I am here to talk about a disturbing book. When I got asked to do this collab and I got told that it was about disturbing books, I knew immediately <laughs> what book I was going to to talk about. Well, my pick is Gone to See the River Man by Christopher Triana. It is 160 pages of pure, disturbing, messed up content. <laughs> this has 
a lot of content warnings attached to it. This book follows the main character named Lori, who has an obsession with this man named Edmund Cox. And Edmund Cox is a serial killer. He has done vile, brutal, nasty, horrible, awful things, and Lori is in love with him. She writes him letters in prison, he writes back, she goes to visit him. They have a close bond. And one day, Edmund asks Lori for a favor. And of course, of course she jumps at the opportunity to prove her love to this man. And he tells her that he wants her to go find this key that he is hidden in his cabin in the woods and take it to the river man. And Lori agrees. Lori actually ends up taking her sister Abby and she's actually the caretaker for Abby. And they go on this journey together. Realistic horror is probably my favorite. Uh, I think it is the scariest. I think it is the most disturbing because it's things that really happen. One of the things that I really find interesting about this book is Lori's obsession and devotion to Edmund Cox. It is very reminiscent of people in love with Ted Bundy, Richard Ramirez, all those other serial killers. I really wanted to learn more about her and, re and really understand how she could hear what he's done and brush it aside and just accept him and accept that what he's doing isn't that bad. As bad as this book gets, <laughs> as bad as everything starts getting and all this information starts unfolding and it just progressively gets more disturbing, I couldn't look away. I couldn't stop. I couldn't put it down. I had to know. I hands down probably the most disturbing book I've ever read. <laughs> Thank you so much to Juan for asking me to be a part of this club. I am very honored. There are so many amazing, amazing booktubers involved in this club, so I am just so honored to be a part of this, and I hope you all find some disturbing and wonderful books to read. A book that is undeniably horrifying is Blindness by Jose Saramago. Uh, picture this. We're at a stoplight in a car uh, with just a guy by himself, and we're with him as he goes blind. Yeah, it's horrifying. And we see an epidemic of blindness go through a city. It's not very clear how widespread it is, but it is definitely a, a full city, a major uh, city. And we see how quickly <laughs> human society breaks down. Individuals can't take care of themselves. Uh, everything breaks down in the face of this epidemic of blindness that takes over. Our narrator is seemingly the only person that can see anything. Everybody is completely blind. They have a white blindness. It is uh, very, very powerful in the way that it depicts uh, this kind of thing. And you don't want to think about it, <laughs> this, this actually happening in any kind of way. It's that disturbing and horrifying um, what he confronts you with as far as human nature and what, where, where society can go very, very quickly um, in this book. It is very scary in that way. I uh, didn't want to think about it while I was reading it too much. Not, not it, but think about the, the thing happening. Because it is uh, powerful. All right. Thank you. Read it. <laughs> I'm Merce, and my channel is Harpies in the Trees, where I review horror books with a supernatural focus. Today I'm going to talk to you about a creepy and disturbing read that I read a few years ago that I still think about from time to time, and it's called The Corset by Laura Purcell. This book is about um, an upper-class woman who has found a passion within studying phrenology. And she is impassioned by it so much, it sort of takes up all of her time and 
consumes her so much that she even heads over to women's jails and measures their skulls to see if they have the measurements to prove that they were born a criminal. While she's doing her field research at one of these prisons, she meets a young girl named Ruth. And Ruth is a very unusual case because she's very young. She's like 15 or 16 years old. She doesn't look like she would hurt anyone ever, um, but she is accused of killing her entire family. This excites Dorothea to no extent. <laughs> uh, she is like, I need to get my hands on this woman's skull and I need to do measurements and I need to, you know, just have access. So she's granted access and she's doing her measurements, but She's just kind of coming up with more and more questions about this girl. It's, she's not really finding the answers that she thought she would. The calculations are not adding up. Ruth is from a very poor family. She's not educated and she's had to work a series of jobs that were very abusive or slave labor like, as you can imagine. This also takes place in Victorian England. So you can imagine the differences between the classes between an upper class woman and a lower class woman. So these struggles are, you know, really part of the book. And also too, the study of phrenology is really important because in this time, it was kind of this era of booming new technology and sciences. People were really getting excited about these new and different ways of interpreting the world. So it's, it's an intriguing moment in time and it's interesting to have this woman who's studying this pseudoscience um, and also the story of Ruth. Now, is it supernatural? Yeah, there are supernatural things here. Um, is it creepy and disturbing? Absolutely. And it's also told in two perspectives. So um, one chapter will be Dorothea and the next will be Ruth, that type of thing. I really liked that. That was cool for me and it wasn't confusing at all. So if you're looking for something like a period story, supernatural and creepy and disturbing, this is a good one. Thank you so much to Plague of Visions for having me. I really do appreciate it. Hello, my name is Jason White and I'm from the channel Jason's Weird Reads. And I wanna take a moment here to thank Juan for asking me to contribute to this really awesome idea. And what I chose, it's a document, a book about something that happened close to home about two hour drive away and it was pretty scary time because uh, we didn't know what was going on we didn't know that we had a serial killer loose in our part small part of uh, southern ontario canada and uh, it turned out to be pretty disturbing and this book is really disturbing so here is the book i read that i find most disturbing. It was 1991 and I was hanging out with my friends in an old shack we found in the town park. My friend talked to the caretaker of the park and he said that we could use the shack as a fort or a hangout so long as we took care of it and so we did. It had electricity and we plugged in a stereo. Smells like teen spirit often played on the radio. It was a new song from a new band and it sounded exciting. There was also in those days reports of the Scarborough Rapist then called the Border Rapist, having struck again. It was beginning to become a concern because we heard about it often. An hour and a half or so drive away, Scarborough wasn't that far from us. What if this serial rapist were to travel? As we later learned, he probably had. What if he turned into a bigger monster, which we also learned later that he definitely had. On June 15th, 1991, Leslie Mahaffey, 14 years old, disappeared from outside her home in Burlington, Ontario, in the early hours of the morning. Mahaffey's body parts were found encased in concrete blocks in Lake Gibson, near St. Catharines, Ontario. April 16th, 1991, Christian French, 15, is abducted as, she's, as she walks from home from school in St. Catharines. French's nude body is found in a ditch in Burlington, Ontario, 500 meters from Mahaffey's grave. On February the 7th, 1993, Paul Bernardo was arrested. It was a scary time, a serial killer living so close, though we didn't necessarily call him a serial killer at the time. Paul Bernardo was convicted of at least 14 rapes and three murders. 
the murders of which he had the help of his wife, Carla Homoka. The first of their victims was Carla's sister, Tammy. They videotaped all three murders and rapes of the victims, which were presented in court as evidence. The book, Lethal Marriage, My Choice for Juan's Disturbing Book Series, transcribed these videos Paul Bernardo and Carla Homoka took while torturing and murdering these young girls. I read the book with my then girlfriend, now wife, during the mid 2000s or aughts, and I have not been able to shake the horrific nightmare visions these transcripts provided since then. This book was by far the hardest book I've ever read. Carla Homoka received 12 years for manslaughter and was released from jail in July of 2005. Paul Bernardo received a life sentence and is currently rotting in jail where he belongs. So if you want to check out a really disturbing true crime book, definitely check out Lethal Marriage by Nick Prawn. It is absolutely awful. Hey fam, how's it going? My name's Amy, and I love to babble my face off over at a channel called Lit Noir. I do book reviews, usually. <laughs> but also ghostly story times and love to chit chat about the scary shit watched on YouTube throughout the week. Today, however, I would love to talk about Adam Caesar's story, Tribesmen, which is like a tipping of the hat to those old films like uh, Cannibal Holocaust and the Italian shit, right? It's a ride. <laughs> You've got like the misogynistic sleazeball freaking directors. It's like, whatever, don't cut, keep rolling. And then you have the, um, tropical island where the natives go and you also have blood guts viscera just flying everywhere so the idea is taking a tiny cast and crew to this beautiful island completely exploiting the freaking natives if you can find them do you know these fuckers no I think my favorite part involved a chicky mama up in a tree. I was very concerned about her because that was going to suck going down. <laughs> it's just not going to be fun and <sighs> bones. So, you know, like, yeah, if, if, if you are a bit sensitive to that shit, you know, like, no, nah. but if, if you dig it, Adam's gotcha. I had a difficult time putting this one down. This was one of those stories, one of those books that I was just taking with me everywhere. Like, okay, it's time to eat now. Walking down the hall to the kitchen, waiting for your shit to cook. Oh no, it's burning. That's it, it hooks you. It hooks you right in. And the next thing you know, the movie, it's done. Oh, whether you like novellas or you're realizing, Oh, it's almost the end of the year, and I am way behind in that challenge I gave myself. Big thanks to Juan for this invitation. These videos are always so much fun to watch, so thank you. And you, I will see you later. Hello, my friends. Hello, and welcome to Stately Vaughn Manor. And thanks, Juan, for inviting me to talk about the most disturbing book I have ever read. Well, for me, fiction is never as disturbing as reality. So the most disturbing book I've ever read is a book called The Lucifer Effect, written by Professor Philip Zimbardo. Zimbardo is famous uh, because he was the guy who masterminded the Stanford Prison Experiment which has become so famous, infamous, in fact, the Stanford prison experiment where he got a bunch of students together and he made some of them prisoners and some of them guards. And the guards were all terrible and horrible and awful and Philip Zimbardo wasn't much better. This experiment actually wasn't that great of an experiment. It could barely really be called an experiment at all. So it's pretty controversial. Also, Philip Zimbardo set himself up as the warden in this experiment, which he shouldn't have done, but it was interesting because he got cut up in the whole evil situation of the Stanford Prison Experiment, an experiment that really should have been cut off in two days, but it lasted six, before he finally realized, oh, this is awful, and shut the thing down. 
But it was interesting because even though it was a poorly done experiment, it did prove some things that ordinary people can become really awful. Any ordinary person can become really awful. And that's the important thing that this book is talking about. Uh, I disagree with a lot of things Philip Z uh, Zimbardo has said at different times, but he's, he's right in that anybody can become evil given the right psychological factors. Anybody can commit immoral acts. And this doesn't just stop with the Stanford Prison Experiment, this book. This includes 30 years of research into why ordinary people can commit awful, awful acts, uh, concluding with a real-life example of the Stanford Prison Experiment, which was uh, the prisoner abuse at Abu Ghraib in 2003. Yeah, Philip Zimbardo was called to be an expert witness for one of the defendants in the trial that resulted from that shameful situation, and it was ghastly. I mean, this book has some ghastly details. It's, it's ghastly in its detail, it's ghastly in its implications, because like I said, given the right set of social circumstances, anyone can go bad, and that is why it's my most disturbing book. Hey everyone, Austin aka Monster Blood here, and today I'm here to talk about a book that I found very disturbing, and that is Immaculate Illibagais' true account of her survival of the Rwandan genocide. This is her story left to tell. And this book has elicited an emotional response from me unlike anything that I've ever read. This book is naturally very sad and tragic and very hard to get through, as it covers one of the most terribly tragic events in history and she explains how she loses most of her loved ones her close friends and family and it is very hard to read and just very sad and not only that this book is also rage inducing at least it was for me there were times i was reading this book where it literally pissed me off as i discovered that the world basically turned a blind eye during this rwandan holocaust and many people stepped to the sidelines. There were very few countries and people that actually helped and stepped in to intervene and aid during this just tragic event. And what perhaps what's even more shocking and remarkable than this display of mankind's capacity for evil and just this mass murder that took place is that not only does Immaculate Illibagaiza manage to survive, she finds it in her heart to forgive those who took the lives of her close friends and family and her loved ones. She manages to find it in her heart to forgive those who sought to destroy her own life. And to me, there's something about that that is just completely mind-boggling because I know for myself, and I believe many people, I believe this is human nature, those who are seeking to destroy you, it is not natural for you to want to forgive or love that person, the natural response, the human instinct is to seek revenge or to fight back. And Immaculate Illibagaiza, after this is all over and she manages to survive, all she can do is look at the positive side of things. All she sees is hope, hope for a future. She wants to help those who have been orphaned. She wants to help this other survivors and she manages to not hold a grudge or become consumed in her bitter emotions by this very traumatic and life-changing event. And to me, there, that is something, there is something pleasantly disturbing about that, something shocking, something that you can look up to and admire about this person who I have nothing but the utmost respect for, even though I don't know her personally. And so, yeah, this is one of the most disturbing books that I've ever read, but underneath all of the chaos and evil and just the atrocious behavior of these people and this Rwandan genocide, there is a message of love and hope being preached. And there is just something that is just so shocking and remarkable about it. And unlike anything that I've ever read.
Welcome back to the Panic Room, everyone. So for today's book, I had to go with Night by Eli Wiesel. Now, don't let the link fool you. This book is so disturbing and has stayed with me for over 20 years. Eli was a young Jewish man during the Holocaust, and this book chronicles a lot of his experiences in the concentration camps under the Nazis. And first and foremost, the reader is kind of devoid of any kind of cushion of fantasy because you are going in knowing that these atrocities actually occurred to this person, to Eli. And Eli is a very vivid author. You know, as you are reading a lot of these experiences, you are taken there. And I don't think that anyone would argue with the fact that these people experience things that no human being should ever have to go through. You know, you see the loss of humanity that Eli experiences because of the things that he has to see and do and experience. And you see the effects of hatred and violence and pure evil on the human animal and how it changes him on a very visceral level down to his very soul. Not only does it change his relationships with other people, it changes his relationship to himself and even to his God. And it's hard to watch. It's hard to, to watch some of these things play out as the reader because you are really transported there and you do not have that cushion of fantasy at all. And Eli holds nothing back absolutely nothing back. You see the actual evil of humanity. And I think therein lies the true horror, because these atrocities were enacted not by monsters, not by, you know, fantasy creatures or whatever, or even, you know, a made-up serial killer. These things happened from other humans. Other humans did this to him. And he is very unfiltered telling you about it, and as he should be. You know, this is a window into a time period in history that not many have the strength to look through, let alone experience. And if all you know of literature or writings from this time is Anne Frank's diary, you know, while that book definitely deserves the merit that it has, I feel like this is a more raw look into that time frame. You know, not to dog on Anne Frank at all, but, you know, I feel like Eli gives you the R-rated version. He, he takes off the rose-colored glasses and shows you exactly what happened, you know, to these people in the concentration camps, and it is disturbing, to say the least. So, be forewarned, guys, but it is definitely a powerful book. But thank you for coming to the Panic Room, guys. Bye for now. Uh, hello there. My name is um, J uh, J Juan. Yeah, Juan. Uh, no, no, I'm not Juan. No, what makes you say that? Juan couldn't possibly be egomaniacal enough to insert himself into a collab that he's hosting for other booktubers. <laughs> How could you even think that? Uh, anyway, yeah, uh, I'm Juan and I host the channel Plagued by Visions. Fuck! All right, fine. The jig is up. It was me the whole time. That actually really fucking hurt. <laughs> anyway, the reason I'm here is because there's just this one book, one of the, my favorite pieces of transgressive fiction, which I've been meaning to cover in this series since part two, and I have just somehow kept forgetting. Why? Because I'm a mess, that's why. But I just thought everybody's having so much fun talking about these absolutely bleak and nauseating titles, and it just inspired me to finally give you a taste of The Sailor Who Fell From Grace With The Sea by Yukio Mishima. I will keep this as brief as possible so that we can return to our regularly scheduled programming. Here's the scene. Yukio Mishima, an ardent nationalist whose impassioned views on glory and manhood led him toward self-destruction, is here detailing the very same flames of discontent and violence that led him to his death through a quiet story that seemingly moves as meandering and calming as the ocean's waves before hitting you with the ravaging force of a tsunami. Also, apparently Yukio Mishima is an LGBT icon, according to this one mural at a random bookstore, but we don't have nearly enough time to unpack that mess. Anyway, the story follows Noboru, a young boy who becomes obsessed and in a skewed way infatuated with Ryuji, a disillusioned sailor whom he sees as representative of all that glory and true unchained beauty of mankind. Someone who traverses the sea, the waters of which promise Noboru an idyllic and wondrous life untethered from the disillusioning land. 
However, this obsession between boy and man becomes increasingly sinister and temperamental until eventually, given a series of betrayals and misunderstandings, it escalates into something so gruesome and despicable that I simply cannot spoil it for you. I just promise you, the ending of this book feels like a fucking sucker punch in a way few other books have ever damaged me and it absolutely belongs on this list. And that's it. That's all I had to say. Holy shit, that is the most brief that I have ever been in my life. Anyway, I won't hog the camera anymore. Back to our wonderful guests. Uh, we still have a couple more to go. And actually, if you've made it this far, you've earned yourself a free barf bag. Just use coupon code I need help to claim it. All right, <laughs> enjoy your stay. Hello, it's Regina from Regina's Haunted Library. Thanks Juan for including me in this video. And uh, here's Lily, she's just saying hi before she gets a little more comfortable. So the book that I chose that really gets under my skin in a very disturbing way is a book I just read and this is The Cipher by Kathy Koja. This book really got under my skin in a way that I haven't experienced for a long time. Uh, I think it reminded me a lot of my own art school angst uh, when I was living in like bad housing with sharing it with a lot of different people and everyone kind of had their art ambitions, but feeling a sense of failure before you even got out of the gate because, you know, it's not that easy to aspire to be an artist. So that kind of self-loathing that uh, sort of permeated the air sometimes, the paranoia of not being able to make a living and the fear of maybe even sharing your work with other people as the character Nicholas, the would-be poet, experiences in this book. It all kind of rang very true to me and uh, in the best possible way. It, it disturbed me, but I couldn't get enough, if that makes sense. And I think that would make sense to horror fans. It's a pretty simple story. There's Nicholas who lives in this shabby apartment and his somewhat girlfriend, uh, lover Nakota. I'm not say sure if I'm pronouncing her name correctly. So they discover in his building this utility closet type of thing where there's a hole, literal hole in the floor. Like I imagined it like a drain hole, but it's like a black hole in that, uh, well, of course it's, it becomes like a, a, a very strong metaphor throughout the whole book of the, the emptiness in these people's lives. But it is a literal hole of horror. Uh, they they uh, coin it the fun hole, which makes it even creepier, where when things, uh, they experiment with putting like a bug down there and seeing what happens and it metamorphosizes in a, in a Kafkaesque kind of horror into this creature. And they do the same with a mouse. Well then, hmm, what would happen if I like put my arm down? Well, you can kind of guess the direction it goes in without giving too much of this away. It is a wonderful example of body horror and uh, existential dread. And it's written in a very artistic style, very poetic, and I just loved it. So I'm glad I finally read this book and I don't think this will be the only time I read this. It really got under my skin. And in a way, just like the fun hole, I can feel it drawing me back to it. I'm Kelsey from the channel Slime and Slashers, and I'm just so overjoyed that Juan asked me to be a part of this collab video. Thank you, Juan. So Juan asked me, you know, give a recommendation for a disturbing book. And honestly, I think this brings up the question, what does disturbing truly mean to somebody? To me, there's two kinds of disturbing. One kind is the kind that is off-putting and anger-inducing and really makes you emotional. Yes, it's an unpleasant experience, but at the same time, it's effective horror because it makes you feel something really deeply. <laughs> so I have an example of a book like that, and that would be Let's Go Play at the Adamses. That was just so maddening. I hated those kids. Those kids are the worst. And they did really disturbing things. It was not a fun read, so I wouldn't recommend it for a great time. But if you're interested in what all the hype is about, because it is a paperback from hell, I would say go ahead, check it out, and judge for yourself. Some parts are a little slow, which is kind of weird to say about a book that I consider disturbing, but 
it is what it is. So other kinds of disturbing books, though, in my opinion, can be fun. And I know that sounds very odd, but I will give you some examples and you'll understand what I mean. So the first one is Hellhound by Ken Greenhall. I think that is a wonderful story in that it's written so masterfully. And it's about a dog. We actually get his point of view, but he's not just any normal canine. He's a murderous and creepy canine. The next suggestion I have is The Nest. It's also well written, just like Hellhound. But on top of that, uh, crazy shit happens. Pardon my French. Like some dudes get their penises chewed off by roaches. Mutant roaches, I should point out. And yeah, I said dudes as in plural, as in more than one. Yeah. But it's not just funny haha, that stuff happens. A lot of carnage takes place in this book. And actually some really heart-wrenching deaths that I think make it a really good read. Another example I have is Such Nice People. And I just read this one. And to quote my friend Kelly, she said, nothing will prepare you for the shed scene. And I do say it's a slow burn, but the character development is really, really good, and I never felt bored. However, some people, it might be too slow for their taste, but once you get into the last 70 pages, it's choice. And then my final book recommendation, and it's actually like my true official recommendation, is Endless Night by Richard Lehman. I will say that Richard Lehman is disturbing because, one, his writing is so wacky and zany in that he makes all of his characters, like, super over-sexualized. And it's not just the women, it's literally everybody. I know Juan has talked about Lehman on his channel before, and he actually described him as a different kind of cozy. I think that's the perfect description for Layman because even after one book, I could just tell that, yeah, there's some weird stuff and it's not written in the best way, but it knocks your socks off because you just want to keep reading until you're done because it's so, so suspenseful and entertaining. And yeah, it's a long book and I read it in two sittings. That's why I loved it. And yeah, there's some stuff that happens. It's a quote my friend Katie, actually. Kilts made of human skin? What more could you ask for? That's a little taste of what's in store with this book. And of course, being a woman, the danger that the main character is in really is that much more terrifying. So not only is the story entertaining, but just the way it's written is kind of cozy, to quote Juan again. It's just, I think you know you're going to have a good time when you're going into a layman book. Thanks again, Juan! Hello friends, my name is Steve from Steve Talks Books and Stuff. I'm here today to talk to you about a disturbing book that you may be interested in. Today I want to tell you about Crossed. It's a comic book miniseries that was 10 issues long and it's now collected in trade paperback form. It's written by Garth Ennis with art by Jason Burroughs. In this 10 issue miniseries we witness the fall of civilization of society as this virus spreads. And what the virus is, it's a virus you can contract through bodily fluids once you contract it, you get a, a red rash on your face in the shape of a cross and you become uninhibited. You do anything you've ever thought of doing. You can, they turn into cannibals. It, they'll torture you. They'll kill you. They'll rape you. They'll do any, any despicable thing you've ever thought of. They will do to you if they catch you. So this virus spreads very quickly. Civilization, everything collapses. And we follow a group of survivors who are struggling to survive and trying to get to an area where there's less crossed. Now with this virus, it's not like 28 days later where they just become mindless, uh, basically fast zombies. They still have the skills they had before. So if you knew how to track people, if you were in law enforcement, if you were in the military, if you had skills uh, of how to, to track people down or how to kill people, how to fly an airplane, how to drive a tank, you can still do those things after you contract the virus. Now this book quickly sets the tone because all these really terrible things happen to these survivors. I mean, they, they die off one by one, they get killed in awful ways and society collapses. And I think the reason this has stuck with me for so long is how quickly the government and society and everything just implodes. And the writer Garth Ennis said that during Katrina is what gave him the idea for the story because he witnessed how quickly things can just collapse to nothing. And if you think the government's going to be there when things hit the fan, guess again, because they won't be, and they're not going to help you and you're on your own. I think it's taken on a whole new life after the pandemic because we've, we've all kind of lived through it now that when things go really bad, you can't depend on the government to be there for you. You know, my government ain't, ain't always going to be there. So you're, you're kind of on your own. And that's what made it a little bit more frightening after the events of the last couple of years. I want to say thanks to Juan for asking me to contribute to this awesome collaboration, and I look forward to watching the other 
suggestions in this video so I can find new material to read to be disturbed with. Thanks again, and we'll talk to you soon. Hello, this is Justin from This Justin. How are you doing? Now, if you saw the last entry in Juan's Disturbing Book series, it may come as no surprise to you that I'll be discussing The Painted Bird by Jerzy Kaczynski, his 1965 novel set during World War II. It tells the story of a six-year-old boy uh, who is sent to the Eastern European countryside by his family, set there for his protection from the Nazi forces that are occupying his home city. Uh, and so uh, during the confusion of the war, the chaos of the war, uh, his family loses touch with him and the woman that he is staying with ends up dying. And so he is lost, left to wander a very rural landscape, a part of the world that seems to have been untouched by time for centuries. Uh, the industrial revolution seems to have completely passed it by. There are no modern conveniences. And these people seem to be in this area seem to be living a very backwards kind of a peasant life. Uh, and so his dark complexion, his dark hair, his dark eyes label him as a gypsy or a Jew, which makes him not only dangerous to harbor as a fugitive, uh, but a danger in and of himself to these peasants and villagers who have very who have superstitions that heavily inform their belief systems. Uh, they see him as either possessed by demons uh, or containing evil powers. And so he is either rejected or if he is allowed to stay with someone, uh, it may often be because they see an advantage to keeping somebody, using somebody that has these powers, uh, but often he is tormented and abused. Uh, and trigger warnings abound for this book. It, The boy witnesses or experiences beatings, torture, murder, sexual assault, uh, incest, bestiality. It's quite a laundry list of horrors and with the Holocaust occurring all around the fringes of the story. Uh, I read The Painted Bird when I was around 12 or 13, which is a pretty young age to read such a dark and violent novel, uh, and, but in its disturbing episodes were, I found quite unsettling and they stayed with me for years to come. And the kind of matter of fact, simple, straightforward prose with that, that describe these sequences of violence, I've also found, I found disturbing. Uh, and this kind of a frank approach to violent content can be almost more disturbing than something might slow down and, and relish its portrayal of such savagery. Uh, but this is contrasted by other moments of reflection or insight that are often lyrical and hypnotic and, and, and beautiful to read. And I was fascinated by this contradiction, a novel that contains a story about the most intense violence that, that humankind has to offer, but still holding some of the most beautiful passages uh, that I'd ever read. I was also fascinated by the simple metaphor that is the novel's title. Uh, one of the people the boy stays with is a bird keeper uh, who is a form of cruel catharsis for himself. Uh, will often capture a bird or take a bird he has captured, paint its feathers different colors, and then release it near a flock of its own kind. And this flock, not recognizing it as one of its own, will often attack this bird, uh, pecking it nearly to death. Uh, and so it goes with our young hero, who in attempting to avoid uh, the modern monsters of the Holocaust, uh, still falls victim to the same kind of brutality and prejudice that is uh, too common a trait of humankind. There's a lot to unpack in The Painted Bird. Uh, I've only touched upon uh, one of its major themes, uh, but uh, I would really, I would highly recommend The Painted Bird uh, for anyone fascinated in, or interested in disturbing literature or, or any kind of literature. Thank you very much for listening. Hi there, I am Lydia from Typical Books, and Juan has invited us all to talk about the books that disturbed us the most. And this is a companion to his most disturbing books video series, and I think it's really cool that he's invited us all to talk about what disturbs us the most. Thank you, Juan, for this opportunity to talk about People Live Still in Cashtown Corners by Tony Burgess. You may recognize that name from the movie Pontypool. He wrote the book and that screenplay. The book, of course, Pontypool Changes Everything. That is basically Tony's shtick, if there were one, is that he writes literary fiction. It is extremely dark and it is surrealistic. So it's, it takes you outside of this regular reading experience. And this book 
is no exception. If you're a fan of something like Joyce Carol Oates' Zombie, or if you liked American Psycho for its surreal nature, then this is a book for you. It's a very short read. It was published in 2010 by the now defunct Cheezine. So I don't know how easy it would be to find a copy, but you could go on a hunt for this book and probably turn it up in a bookstore for sure. It is a book about Bob Clark. Bob works at a gas station. He discovers that murder is magic. And he takes us through in this first person narrative to explain to us exactly how, maybe not why, and not with much clarity because he is suffering some sort of psychotic break. The nature of which is detailed through Bob's own eyes. We get to see a very interesting slice of life of what it may be like on the other side of the mask. And in reading the way that Bob is thinking through all of this, you can imagine that this sort of thing isn't too far from happening to any one of us. And part of the disturbing nature of this book for me was subjective. I read it all in one sitting. It's about 200 pages and I read it all while super sick with a flu and on a lot of cough medicine. So that enhanced the disturbing nature of this, but I do recommend reading it all in one sitting. Definitely. Another thing that really made this a disturbing experience is that it is written sort of like a true crime. There are photos in the center of the book that the author had taken himself. And being a true crime affectionado, I just loved this sort of extra detail that make it feel so real. And it is based loosely on a true crime story. This book has stuck with me so much. I kind of yearn for this sort of immersive experience, which I haven't quite had with the books that I've read since. And I hadn't quite experienced it up until this point. And that's saying quite a bit because I do read for that immersive experience, like a lot of us do. And I do read a lot of disturbing literature and a lot of first person's perspective on serial killing or mad men or psychos. I love that sort of stuff. So I've read quite a bit of it, but nothing quite hit the way that Bob Clark hit as written by Tony Burgess. So thank you, Tony, for disturbing the hell out of me all of these years. This came out in 2010 and I read it shortly after. So it's been about 10 years of Bob infecting my mind. So thank you, Juan, for inviting us all to talk about the books that disturb us the most. I hope that there's a huge list of books to buy, including People Live Still in Cash Town Corners by Tony Burgess. Thanks. Hey guys, Violet here from the Violet Print YouTube channel, and I just want to say thank you so much, Juan, for including me in this. I am very excited to share with you guys the most disturbing story that I have ever read. I didn't want to choose something that was really focused on body horror, extreme horror, or something that's rooted in reality because I feel like that kind of disturbs everybody. So what if we were to look at the novels and stories most people are familiar with and find the one that truly is the most disturbing under the surface? And that to me is easily Jan Alvide Lindquist's Let the Right One In which has been turned into multiple films, is about to be a series, and is a book that a lot of people love and adore, and rightfully so. But underneath it all, I find Let the Right One In to easily be the most disturbing story I have ever read. Not only does this story have a very deep-rooted subplot that is a full tribute to Nabokov's Lolita within the story of Ellie and her familiar Hakan, um, but the core root of this story it has always been marketed as a vampire romance novel between um, a 12 year old boy and Ellie, our vampire in a 12 year old's body. Um, but in reality, I don't think this is a romance story at all. I actually think this is a familiar's origin story. And it is actually the story of how a centuries old vampire can parade herself around as a 12 year old child and manipulate and exploit a 12 year old to basically becoming her familiar forever. And we see Oscar's own future depicted in the storyline of Hakan. And this is one of those stories that I feel like you don't actually realize that any of this is happening until you get to that very, very, very last page. And while I don't want to spoil anything in this book, I think it is very wrong to look at this story as, like I said, a romance, a love story. Um, this is a very bleak, dismal story about taking advantage of somebody and exploitation and how we can really get under somebody's skin and use sex and manipulation to get what we want from someone. 
And while the book does promote Hakan almost as a villain and Oscar as our hero, in reality we see them kind of both as the same. And I think that even leads to something more disturbing where we can take a middle-aged pedophile and compare him to a 12-year-old boy. And if you really read into it, Oscar is really not that good of a character. He has the seeds sprinkled to become the serial murderer that he's about to become to be at least familiar. Um, and <laughs> it's something that you is never explicitly said in the novel, and again, it's not until you close that last page and you really think about everything that has happened out in front of you that you realize exactly where this story is going. Um, and I think that's very dark and sad and tragic and it is once again just another story of the manipulation of children and the exploitation of children um, where you are believed to read it as a con being the Humbert Humbert and Ellie being our Lolita character, you will eventually find out that Ellie is actually our Humbert Humbert and Oscar is our Lolita character. And it's very sad and very tragic and very much a villain origin story. So yes, Let the Right One In is by far the best vampire story I have ever read, by far one of the most unique stories I've ever read, and easily the most deeply unsettling and disturbing story I have ever read. And again, thank you so much, Juan. So, so happy to be a part of this. Mwah. Oh, hello there. I'm YouTube's Will of the universally beloved YouTube channel, Will to Read. And I'm here today because Juan cordially invited me to completely destroy your emotional well being. But, you know, in a fun way. So, as a horror enthusiast, I've read quite a few messed up works of fiction, and on top of that, I'm currently working on a master's in history, and one of my primary areas of interest is colonialism, so needless to say, I have a lot of material to work with. Today, I'm going to be recommending a book from the latter category, and it's actually a book that I read near where some of the events described actually happened. That book is... Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee by D. Brown. The best summation of this book comes from a blurb on the back, which reads that it's a history about how the West was lost. This book was first published in 1970, at the tail end of the Western's Golden Age. Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee is pretty clearly trying to counteract a lot of the narratives put forward by that film genre, such as Manifest Destiny and The Open Frontier. The reality is that the frontier wasn't open. People had been living there for hundreds of years, and the United States came in and ripped those people from their ancestral lands, and in many cases, just killed them. The United States is a house built on a foundation of blood. Sorry, uh, <laughs> I, I don't know what came over me there. This book isn't disturbing because it has over-the-top descriptions or because it's pushing, pushing against any kind of societal taboo. It's disturbing because the events described happened and the repercussions of these events still have a huge impact on the people of these tribes to this very day. Thanks for the invite, Juan. Hope it wasn't too much of a downer. Hey everyone over at Plague by Vision Land. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Juan. You are a king, you are a friend, you are much, much appreciated. What an honor to be considered to be in this video with all these other great booktubers. Please go check them out. Uh, so, let's get into business here. I was asked to pick my most disturbing book. And there are quite a few, but I wanted to be different because usually people know me in my old gray hat that I wear at work to talk about independent and small press horror, the ones that really go bump in the night, the ones that creep you out, grotesque, extreme horror. But today, I'm going to go different. I'm going to go literary, and I'm going to pick Betty 
by Tiffany McDaniel. Now, this is kind of a regional literature style story, uh, totally different than what I normally read and kind of what I want to get more into in 2022. I want to start diverging from my traditional reads. So this one is super, super terrifying because it covers the things that really happen in America, the things that really can happen in a person's family. Are you a product of your upbringing or can you uh, move past it? Uh, so this this young woman uh, who turns out to be, I believe, it, it's been a while since I read it, I uh, believe it is the author's mother or grandmother. And uh, she basically had a tough upbringing. A lot of people, I mean, Ohio is not the South, but down south and in rural America, uh, there was a lot more problems than we have today. And uh, life was just different. Families acted different. And there is severe emotional trauma, severe physical abuse that happens in this book. Um, a lot of people know the story, um, uh, The Girl Next Door by Jack Ketchum. Well, this uh, hit about as hard as that book did for me. I would say The Girl Next Door hit harder but this book stuck with me, and I will forever keep my copy. I even I had to do a little little repair, but I will reread this down the line. Uh, I don't want to spoil anything for you guys because a lot of the twists and turns of the story, uh, you got to find out for yourself. It's super terrifyingly sad, and sometimes the sad things in life are really scary. And the things that you and I are afraid of on a daily basis is some of the things that this young woman had to deal with. And I adored, adored, adored the father of the story. Hit me in my dad feels. So thank you again, Juan, for having me on the channel. I appreciate you. A little candle for the occasion. And uh, I look forward to this video. So thank you guys. Peace. In a minute, I'll, I'll play Legos with you in a minute. I have to shoot a video real quick for someone. I don't know, some dude on YouTube about books. I, I don't know, I'll just, I'll just wing it. Yeah, I didn't plan anything, I'll, I'll just wing it. Oh, hey, what's going on guys? My name is Jay, this is The World According to Jay. It's your one-stop shop for independently published and small press books, mainly of the horror and dark fiction, the gritty, weird, odd genres. So if that's what you're looking for, Come on home. Bring your own toilet paper though, okay? So, one over at Plague by Visions was like, dude, dude, you wanna be in my video? And I was like, man, I, I can't do that again. I mean, I'm still recovering from the scandal last time. He was like, no, 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 not that again. No, we're, we're past that. This is a video about disturbing books. All right, yeah, I can do that, I can do that. So, my pick for Juan's disturbing book project is, Perpetual Dread from my friend Brian Bowyer. Now, this is a little bit more than just a disturbing book. This is a collection of stories. Yeah, it's, it's a short story collection. These stories are so dark and full of so many trigger warnings. <laughs> you have to maybe read one, set it down, walk away for a little bit, and then come back to it. All right? And I'll tell you right now. There's not one happy story in this bunch. And it has just enough extreme in it, you know, to make you kind of shift your weight in your chair, make your skin itch. That's the kind of extreme we're talking about. I highly recommend it. <laughs> You're probably thinking, dude, why do you highly recommend it if it's that bad? Simple. This is totally entertaining. Yeah, Bowyer has a way to, to make the dread in this collection very meaningful. He's not just, you know, throwing the unadulterated craziness out there just for shock value or to meet a word count. Trust me, there are a lot of books like that. No, instead, Bowyer brings us perpetual dread and he's able to kind of place us within these dark, grim stories and allows you to experience the events firsthand. These stories take you to the edge, all right? And you think you're about to go over the edge and it's all doom. No, 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 no. He's like, hey, just step back just a tad bit. 
He has total control of you. Side note, uh, there is a lot of alcohol, a lot of booze throughout these stories in this collection. So there's a good chance you may get a little tipsy just from reading it. Something else I enjoy is the way Bowyer presents these stories. It's very straightforward, no frills. No frills need it because the extreme is there, it's in your face, no reason to beat around the bush and have a huge build up because you know pain is coming. This is Perpetual Dread from Brian Bowyer. This is my pick for Juan's Disturbing Book Project. Check it out. I guarantee you'll be disturbed in a good way. That's it, guys. My name is Jay. Thanks for listening. See ya.